Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this week instead of talking about space, I want to talk about some more earthly concerns. Now, I live in California. We do have a rather seismically active part of the world. If you paid attention to the news the last week, you'll know that there have been nuclear tests in North Korea and yesterday a massive earthquake off the coast of, Mer uh, of Mexico. And first thing I thought of are the guys from Squad OK and they tell us that they're shaken, but they're all right. But I'm not all right with the journalists that keep on automatically appending the words Richter scale every time they see a magnitude reported for an earthquake. So this is kind of an interesting subject. I did a bit of geology, but earthquake magnitudes mostly don't use the Richter scale anymore. It's, a, it's an older system. So let's kind of rewind to how this all got started. Back at the start of the century, there was a guy called uh, Giuseppe Mercalli, and he created what was called the Mercalli Earthquake Scale. And it was based on a bunch of subjective measurements. You know, they would basically take reports of what people had observed, what they had experienced in the earthquake, and uh, depending upon whether they felt the shaking, whether books fell off the shelves, whether buildings fell down, they could assign a value from uh, zero to 10, basically. So it was highly subjective. It didn't really measure the intensity of the quake. It measured the amount of shaking that was observed in a particular region. And as you know, as you probably know, with earthquakes, that can vary. The closer you are to the quake, the, the stronger the intensity. At, uh, depending upon the type of soil you're on, you'll get different kinds of shaking happening. And of course, some people just sleep through the whole thing, so different populations would experience it differently. And so, in the 1930s, entered Charles Francis Richter and his lesser-known co-worker, Beno Gutenberg. Now, uh, he de decided to define his scale based upon something that was actually measurable and reproducible the amount of deviation or amount of displacement in a seismograph at a known distance. So a Richter, the, the zero point for the scale is a one micrometer movement at 100 kilometers from the epicenter. And that's fine, except that he studied the data that was available and realized that there would be many millions of, uh, or there would be a factor of millions between the weakest and the strongest things that could be detected. So, he did what all good scientists do and used a logarithmic scale. Each step up the Richter scale increases the magnitude of displacement in that needle by a factor of 10. There's actually an interview with Richter where he talks about having to deal with this unimaginably large range of measurements and Beno Gutenberg suggesting that they use a logarithmic plot. He says that I was lucky because logarithmic plots are a device of the devil, and indeed they are very powerful. They feel that you are invoking satanic forces sometimes. Anyway, a factor of 10 between each magnitude means that the needle increases its amplitude by a factor of 10, but because of the physics of the situation, the actual energy at the epicenter is closer to a factor of 32. Two magnitudes difference is actually 1,000 times the energy of the generating quake. Now the zero point on the Richter scale is interesting because it was chosen based upon the lowest or the weakest earthquake that could possibly be observed with the hardware of the era. He didn't want to have negative magnitude earthquakes coming out because of course it's a logarithmic scale, something that was 10 times weaker uh, as then the weakest earthquake that could be observed in the 1930s would be a magnitude minus one. These microquakes could be seismically interesting, I'm sure, but they, of course, they wouldn't be felt by people. So anyway, that was where the zero point was. And later magnitude measurements were, of course, normalized to be close to the Richter scale so that uh, at least a magnitude five on the, mo on the latest scale would be similar to a magnitude 5 on the Richter scale. The other thing about the Richter scale is that it was based on a single measurement of the amplitude, the maximum am amplitude, and as you can imagine, seismic waves are complex beasts. For example, when a quake happens, it sends out at least two main classes of waves. You have the push waves, which travel really quickly, and then you have the S waves that follow them up, and of course, you measure the time of arrival of each class of waves and then that lets you figure out how close you are to the epicenter. 
That was of course known back by, by Richter and it was incorporated into their magnitude model. Now, later on, Richter and Gutenberg tried to uh, improve on their model, to, on their system, to uh, work for earthquakes at much longer ranges. So they came up with their P wave measurement and they came up with a, a measurement based upon the S wave. So these were the body wave magnitude scale and the surface wave magnitude scale. These were great, I mean, they improved on it. But uh, still the Richter scale was only working on this single magnitude measure. And this began to be a, this would be a big problem with big quakes because they would be measuring the amplitude where the detectors were most light, were more sensitive, right? And that was typically with waves that are about 120 of a hertz. For the really, really big earthquakes, the low frequencies could be minutes and those would just not be picked up. There could be tons of energy in frequencies that weren't covered by the seismometers and they were just being, uh, they were being underestimated terribly. So for example, a 1960 quake in Chile was like 9.5 magnitudes on the modern scale and it, it wouldn't show up as anything more than seven on the, the Richter style scale. So yeah, in the 70s, they developed a new system. This wasn't Richter, this was a completely different set of people. They started to try to standardize this, try to look at all the frequencies that were coming out of an earthquake and try to figure out where the energy was. And so this is the modern moment magnitude scale. It's trying to measure the amount of energy that's coming out of a quake. And what they're really approximating this back to is the they try to measure how much slippage is occurring along a fault line. So they attempt to measure the cross section that's moved and how far it has moved. So you multiply one by the other and then you multiply it by mu, which is their kind of magic estimate of the strength of the material slipping. And that gives them the energy of the quake. And it works for everything. It requires a lot more complex analysis. You have to look at the waves to estimate uh, these cross sections and the slippage. But uh, there are tools that do this, especially with multiple uh, stations. So the system has moved from being a simple measurement of the maximum amplitude to measuring the whole frequency distribution and amplitude of all of these things and the timings and the distance. And this is how you get a modern moment magnitude scale. So the modern systems will have complete range. They can go all the way up to, you know, a 10 and above without breaking down, but uh, they still follow the general uh, concept of the Richter scale. So yeah, you know, every two magnitudes corresponds to roughly 1000 times the energy of the base uh, of the base event. And since we're working in energy, it's much easier to equate this back to say, a nuclear weapons test, although nuclear weapons test, as you can imagine, would have a completely different seismographic signature to say a fault line slipping off the coast of Mexico. But ultimately, my point still stands that when you see any earthquake magnitude being reported for a large event, it is not going to be a Richter scale magnitude. So when you see a journalist appending that, it is not right. Now, local earthquakes, uh, they actually will still use the Richter scale because they work over small uh, things, but uh, the US Geological Service won't report that and they won't report using those units. These are typically measurements that will come out of a single station or a couple of stations. When you have the might of the analytical power of the USGS, you're going to go straight to the proper scientific measurement and get some good numbers right away. Uh, so yeah, the North Korean test, people asked about that. It was basically one magnitude roughly higher than the previous one. So it's reasonable to assume that it's about 30 times more powerful, putting it up into the 100 to 200 kiloton range right now. And I would love to talk about nuclear weapons at some point, but <laughs> we're, uh, I've even thought bigger than this. You know, I did the math once and I figured out that the uh, the KT event, you know, the asteroid impact event that killed the dinosaurs, that is roughly a 13 to 14 magnitude earthquake event. You know, it's, it's crazy the, the stuff that can come out of this. Similarly, you know, did you know that seismometer networks can actually detect spacecraft? Now, um, you know, you might think, yes, launches, those generate some rumbling, but um, 
The space shuttle returning, as it would fly across the US, it would generate a sonic boom, and that sonic boom would travel across the country, and it would hit buildings, and the buildings would get pushed slightly, and of course they would get pushed and they would push the ground beneath them, so there would be a traveling seismic event getting pushed across the US at the rate of uh, the space shuttle's re-entry, and this was picked up on seismometers, so, you know, yeah, there's my space thing for this mission. I'm not really a geologist, and there's probably many better videos on this subject, but yeah, whenever you're reading this in the press, make sure you uh, stop talking about Mr. Richter, because he's rarely involved these days. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.